I, we spent a lot of uh, uh, the last few lectures going through some substancing, but also going through uh, a lot of methodology. So I thought that today we have kind of earned the right to uh, go to be deep longer on substance and shorter on methodology. So what I'm going to do is a bit of an overview of uh, what we have learned over the years and on uh, uh, the education systems and you know what is wrong with them. If you remember our, in our first lecture, I showed you some, some numbers on what kids know and basically that's kind of the central puzzle I'm going to, to study today. So there is a, a lot uh, because um, I think for practical reasons, it turns out that it's relatively easy to experiment on kids because they are your captive audience in classrooms. So a lot of the movement of running randomized control trials started on, school, on, on asking questions on school quality. So this is really one area where you can go beyond uh, a, si a single well-identified study tells you a, a thing to step back and think, you know, how does the whole picture look like? And where issues of external validity and this, that, and the other applies less because it's not that you're interested in each of the points specifically, but how the whole picture uh, uh, fits together. And in some areas, we, we are not at, at this point yet. We are kind of, we have a disparate set of facts. I think the economics of a family, gender is a little bit like that, where we are still trying, trying to feel our way around uh, by uh, looking at various case studies and various things. But the education one is one, education supply, the quality of education is really where one place where we have more to say. So I thought I would take advantage of that to, 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 to do one more of these overview lectures instead of drilling down in details on um, what would have been for today, which is uh, uh, some regression discontinuity design. So we'll, we'll have to find another time to, uh, uh, for an example on RDD or maybe do it in recitation. Uh, so obviously, it's useful to put that in context of the COVID-19 pandemic because it's a real, uh, like it's a total tsunami <laughs> on the education system in developing countries. In developed countries as well, obviously, uh, in the US, uh, a lot of kids stayed out of school for more than a year. But uh, worldwide, 300 million children have been affected by school closures. Uh, and in many countries, the schools are yet to reopen. In India, for example, it's mostly not reopened. So as of today, as most of the kids now in rich countries are back in schools, there are still 128 million of the kids who are still affected. That should be the end of uh, September of 2021, uh, who have not gone back to school. And they are now all in, in poor countries. So um, that's uh, big. <laughs> and perhaps not surprisingly, but uh, it, it's been actually measured it has catastrophic impact on, on learning levels, even in the short run. Uh, what you can see is that, for example, uh, so this is the data from Prata that looks at, uh, um, that uses their simple ACER test, the simple tool for measuring reading and, uh, and mathematics ability, looking at uh, arithmetic, and I'll show you the reading in the next time. Uh, so in 2018 and in 2021, a sample of about 20,000 um, 20, kids that they had done in, in 2018 and were able to follow in 2021. And what we have here is uh, uh, already in the best of time, it's not that good. If you take this, the kids in standard uh, five, for example, uh, they um, only 34% uh, uh, of them can do uh, a division, oh, okay, just a division at, that di at the division level. So another 20% are, are one level above. So about half of the kids can do, so half of the kids, little more than half of the kids can do at least a subtraction um, in, in standard five. Um, little less than half of the kid could do at least a subtraction in, uh, in standard four. And it's an easy subtraction. It's like a two digit minus two digit with carryover. But then if we are looking at, uh, at this one now, basically the standard five kids are now below 50%. And the standard four kids, basically none of them are at division level, almost. So about a quarter of the kids are at subtraction or above. So we started from a low level, and with the pandemic, we have a catastrophically low level. 
And of course, we don't know how people will catch up, but uh, um, it has been so slow. Any progress on quality of education over the years has been so slow that a decline like that is going to be uh, a big thing to, to recover. Same thing uh, in reading. So if you're looking, for example, at the, uh, the fraction of kids in, in, in standard five uh, who were at standard two level, it was 46% uh, before, um, before the pandemic, and it's at 34% uh, at the time they did the survey. And since then, these kids in Karnataka are still not in back in school. So this is still a snapshot. We don't know what's going to happen uh, in the future as they go back to school. But there are two things that are probably going to happen. On the one hand, a lot of the kids, the older kids, are just not going to go back at all. So the re-enrollment of teenagers presumably is going to be uh, to be quite low. So it's a you know it's a generation that is going to suffer an enormous amount. Uh, I was talking to David Atkin, who pointed out, you know, maybe the other it will kind of even out. The other generation will be more educated. So it's just this one generation. Maybe it's not that bad on aggregate. That's going back to this equilibrium impact. But for that generation, it's certainly a disaster. And then the other thing is that for the kids who will go back to school, they will go back to school with a very different experiences, uh, with even more heterogeneity in levels that they started from. Because another thing of this that you see, even from this simple test, is not only the levels are low, but the, the kids are all over the place. Some kids in standard uh, one can read at standard two. That's very many. And a lot cannot even recognize the letters. That's in normal time. Uh, uh, and then in, in the, uh, after the pandemic, that there is even more that cannot recognize the letters. But there is still, it's not kind of neatly organized around the diagonal. So kids of the same age are very different, uh, arrive at different levels. And that's, uh, that's true in 2018. That's even more true in 2021. And so that's something the school system will have to grapple with. But in some sense, uh, although uh, I think this is a catastrophe and something that probably you guys, some of you guys will want to study. Uh, Salome is already kind of working on it in Mexico in the in the present, but in the future, as the pandemic subsides, the question of how the reentry will take place will, will be pretty central. But, but in some sense, uh, it's not new. Like in the US, the, the, uh, very much like in the US, the, the uh, racial discrepancy in the burden of disease kind of put a magnifier on existing uh, uh, racial discrimination across any number of dimensions that sort of collapsed in, uh, that coalesced in to produce that outcome. Similarly, this, uh, this uh, uh, drop in the level combined with increase in heterogeneity of experiences exacerbate existing trends. And the trend are basically that uh, you, f you find very high enrollment rates, but uh, f a lot of absenteeism. Uh, and uh, very low learning levels. So this is for India, and then I'll show you the, the world in the, in the next slide. This is a picture from 2014, but it, you know, post until the pandemic, it was uh, uh, more or less correct. Most of the kids are enrolled. So 2014, you had 97% of kids enrolled in school. This was the, the sixth year in a row that uh, enrollment had been at 96% or above. So that's great, but the attendance is not very good. If you show up on any random day, uh, you find 71% of the children actually present. And it's not always the same 71%. So it means that like, the, the kids get between their own absences and the absence of the teachers, they, they miss uh, maybe about half of the school day they should have. And they go one day, they come back the next day, they go one day, they come back the next day. So the, 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 the absent, their presence pattern is extremely irregular. And then this is uh, not equal across the country. So in the north, in Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, West Bengal, the absence rates are even lower with about 50% presence. And it's better in the south, like many of the social patterns. Uh, if you're looking at the, the world as a whole, we don't have uh, perfect data for the world as a whole. But uh, uh, this is an uh, enrollment with the darker, uh, the better. So basically, most countries now, and this is again pre-pandemic, most countries were 
uh, at, uh, that w where uh, data was measured were above 90 percent. You know, with some exception in the basically the only exception being the Sahel countries, uh, uh, which have uh, lower um, lower uh, enrollment. Um, but other than then this band where enrollment remain an issue, the question of enrollment had somehow been uh, had been solved. By the way, during the pandemic, most of the kids stayed enrolled because nobody bothered to take them off the roll. But that doesn't mean they, they're really there. Uh, but the absence, of course, is even is is uh, is, is much much less good. So here, the, there are much fewer countries in dark blue, uh, uh, quite a few countries in solid blue, and but we see countries appar appearing in, in in light blue. So this is India between 70 and 80 percent. Happy to see that the two sources coincide, uh, and then. Uh, we still have our Sahel country where not only they are not enrolled, but in addition they don't go, uh, and, and other countries where it's in the, you know, Pakistan and et cetera, where it, it goes into the red and yellow. So people don't show up that much. And then, as we already saw, they, they don't learn that much. Again, that's data from, from India uh, uh, since until 1916. It's continued uh, similarly. The fraction of standard two kids who can who can read a standard five kids who can read a standard two text, so like a paragraph basically, uh, and it's uh, you know less than half, not really going anywhere until it collapsed in, in 2021. Uh, if anything, in math, it's a bit worse. So that's the type of problems that they solve, uh, or that they are required to solve. And the way the test works is that they are first shown the uh, two-digit subtraction. If they can do it, they are asked for a division. If they cannot do it, they are asked to recognize the numbers, two-digit number, and then one-digit number. So that's how you have this level. Um, so who can do a subtraction? Uh, so we already saw this type of numbers. But in standard five, only half of the kids could do a subtraction in 2014. And in standard eight, only 44% uh, of the kids could do this division. So this, in a sense, was the well-known problem. Maybe it was known to you, maybe it was non, not known to you, but it was well known to, uh, um, say, the general education establishment. Uh, this is uh, something that, again, is not specific to India. For a while, we've known it mostly for India because Pratam run every year this uh, ASER survey where they went to every single district and surveyed a representative sample of kids, regardless of their enrollment status. Uh, since then, the World Bank has done, and then after the Pratam effort, it sort of expanded in other places, and then we also have those big standardized tests like the PISA, which are used mostly in the richer countries, uh, and then different countries started running their Pratam, their ASER types uh, tests. So there was a little bit of uh, uh, kind of impressionist data flowy, floating all over the place. And under Penny Goldberg, when she was chief economist, and with the huge effort of Noam Angres, that would be Josh's son, uh, they made an effort to uh, uh, harmonize uh, the learning levels uh, across, uh, across uh, countries, basically by uh, linking them back to an, uh, to, to an asset like scale. Uh, so it's a scale in 600, but uh, basically using countries like India, for example, that have both a PISA-like test and a simple instrument, and then um, to create a sort of a, a crossover. So every country that has the two tests can be used to create a crossover between the different tests. And in this way, you can move from, you know, to put on a common scale countries that don't have at all a common test. So it's kind of a chain of things. So it's a little bit impressionistic, but it's, it's a nice database. It's publicly available. They published a uh, um, small descriptive paper on it in, in Nature recently. And the, the data is available, so that's something interesting to, to play with. And this is one of their descriptive things. So it's kind of hard to interpret the scale, of course, the 600, whatever that means. But uh, for example, you have Singapore here, the US here, and the worst country is like uh, way below. Uh, so there, there is vast differences in the in in what people learn, uh, um, in a, you know, in what people know, let's say, from this learning test, and generally it's pretty correlated with income levels, uh, where uh, poor countries 
Afrique, this kind of uh, is a cluster of African country here that does pretty badly. Uh, uh, India, just to tell you that India, that, we, that we've talked a lot about India, and we are going to talk a fair amount about India. You might think, well, there's something specific about India. It's not, it's terrible. But India is actually not that, you know, it's sort of where it should be on the, on the line. So it's relatively specific, uh, relatively uh, representative of what's going on in the world. So that's the part that I would say is known, was known. And to start with, it's a big problem that kids, everyone's going to school, they spend a lot of time in school, and then they learn very little. It seems to be a big waste of time for everyone involved, and, um, and a problem because it would be nice if people learned more. But in some sense, I've come to, uh, to realize that that might not be the worst problem that, that schools are worse than that. They are worse than not being a very effective production function. And that in our focus on production function, we are missing uh, a couple of things. Uh, the first one, the, the, and the, the perhaps the most important thing, which I want to, uh, which I want to convey is that schools are not only they are unable to teach anything, but they are unable to leverage and to acknowledge the skills that are already there. Uh, so in fact, they don't teach, but they also have a role of certification, and they also should you know, leverage what's there and kind of transform it so that kids can learn more, and they are completely unable to do that. So not only they don't teach, but they also don't certify knowledge that they, that's already there. So they are missing at their second task, which is pretty important because that's what people, you know, uh, are able usually to take to the labor market is a diploma. Uh, if the schools taught nothing, at least they should be able to administer the diploma that if you have the skills, you should be able to, to get the parchment paper that goes with it. Uh, so why do I think that schools are unable to uh, to both leverage and uh, recognize the knowledge that's there. Uh, so I'll give you two, uh, two examples where that's pretty egregious. Uh, both I'm involved with. Uh, one is uh, um, a set of studies that I've done with uh, um, a psychologist at Harvard, uh, Liz Pelke, who is a, a specialist of uh, mass, uh, mass uh, early childhood math education. And uh, Josh Dean, who was then a student here, is now at Chicago. Uh, and, um, and a student of, of, of Liz, who is now at NYU in the psychology department. Uh, so what we did is that, so the objective of this work and the reason why I came to, sort of came to see her and to ask her to work with me, uh, is com going to come back in a, uh, towards the end of this lecture where I had been working with primary school and trying to improve the quality of primary school for a long time and found it very difficult because even though we have interventions that we know work, it's like pulling teeth to get them adopted. So we'll go back. One of the things I want to discuss today is why that's the case. But for now, take that for a fact. Uh, we have ideas of what, what, what works, but nobody is interested in it. Okay. So I felt, but at the same time, more and more kids go to preschools, and there nobody cares what they do in preschool. Uh, it could be um, singing or mopping the floor or whatever. It doesn't really matter. It's childcare. So no one has much of a view. So I thought, well, that's like a, a margin of action. <laughs> we, we should try and uh, act in preschool to make the poor kids ready for school rather than try to fix the problem once they are in school. And since uh, Liz was working on, uh, on, on preschool, on pr early childhood ac acquisition of math, I thought maybe she knows something about or can develop something about that, uh, that we can implement in, in, in preschools to make the kids in preschool ahead of the game and able to understand better what's going on in school. So, uh, so she was super uh, interested in doing that. So we started with a small experiment, about 1,500 kids in, uh, in preschool, uh, preschool classes operated by Pratam in Delhi. So this is kind of a class which is on a porch, uh, like a few kids and a, and a young woman. That's your class. And they are playing one of our games. So we had three conditions. One is math games, uh, where they played a, a curriculum for a few weeks, a whole curriculum on, 
um, kind of building um, non-symbolic math skills. I'll tell you what it is in a second, how it works. Then we had a sort of active control condition, which is playing very similar games, but to teach social skills instead of uh, math. The idea was not so much to teach social skills, although why not, it doesn't hurt, but uh, uh, mainly to have, uh, because not much is happens in those schools at all in general. So we didn't want to say that well, they're learning better because someone is finally talking to them, but they could be talking to them about something totally different. So that's our active control, and then a normal uh, curriculum. Uh, so we did some pre-tests and the games uh, for three months, and then a first post-test, and then we continued tracking the kids after they've reached school, so long time after we have anything to do with them. And in a sense, that's the key. Is, um, so that's sort of that's the, the game. So this is based on this idea that uh, um, this cognitive scientists developed that uh, before uh, uh, humans, or in fact animals, develop any notion of uh, symbolic mathematics, so understand numbers, for example, uh, we already have uh, a sense of, uh, some basic sense of mathematics. For example, what is bigger and what is smaller. And barring extreme disability, everyone has that. And it can be trained. You can become better at it. And uh, from a purely correlational point of view, uh, kids who were better at this type of test when they were five are doing better at PISA mathematics at 15. Of course, what we don't know is that it means they have an underlying ability that makes them good at all sorts of math, or whether this is that non-symbolic uh, skills that kind of they built on more effectively to learn math throughout their, throughout their career. Uh, but what, she, what, what uh, they certainly hoped is that that was the case. And therefore, our, uh, the idea of our curriculum was initially to train non-symbolic math skills only and to see whether there is a, a translation of this, first of all, whether this can be trained, and second of all, whether if we manage to train them, whether there is a translation in symbolic math skills down the line. So that's an example of a game. Uh, you have a card, you, you know, one has more dots than the other. Uh, I think you can guess uh, without counting. And so the kids move the one that has more dots towards the, the, the red bar. This turn, that's, that's the hardest one, because there are more points. So young kids cannot do the many points and then as you get older. And you can practice with that, and then you become better as you practice. Then when they turn the card, it actually gives them some more representation, including symbols. So that introduces a little bit of the translation. Uh, one, kid, one thing kids are also surprisingly good is uh, visual form analysis. So here it's like there's one card that's not the same as the other. Uh, what's the card that's different. The one that has the, the floating point, so they, they choose, these are plastic cards, they choose, oh, that was the wrong one, that's the right one. Uh, and then we had very, very similar things for uh, uh, very structured, same rules to learn uh, um, uh, emotion and gaze. So for example, uh, this is the odd one out, all of these are reasonably happy, this one is so that's the equivalent for social games. So we kind of constructed games that were precisely the same, but uh, in that sense, working with uh, psychologists is interesting because they really get into the details of things uh, more than we do. Okay, what do we find? So the first finding, and I want you to keep that, hold that thought because that's gonna come handy uh, in a little while, is that the kids, uh, so this test, these games were developed in Harvard, in uh, Lise's lab at Harvard, and tested in Cambridge with whoever has, uh, is volunteer. If you have kids, you can uh, go uh, from infant to, uh, to 10. Uh, I've taken my own kids, it's quite fun. They make them play all sorts of experiments. And then in particular, they, they came and played, our, uh, they came and played our, our games. So we have observations from uh, the kids, mostly of postdoctoral students and assistant professors. And, that kind of things in Cambridge. And, uh, and then we did the exact same, you know, we have the exact same measurement for these Indian kids who are living in slums in Delhi. And they are just as good at playing these games. They learn the rules, they are able to learn quickly, they progressed fast. 
are they are just as much of uh, these poor Indian kids have just as uh, much an intuitive grasp and interest in number and geometry as the uh, uh, kids of uh, of uh, you know the faculty brats in in the in um, in Cambridge. So that's kind of descriptive. It's nothing to do with the intervention, but it's interesting. The second thing is that uh, you can definitely train those ni this ni non symbolic mass test. Uh, this bar is simply the difference between a treatment and a control control. And then for the for the symbolic for the math games and that for the social games, you can see that even with the social games they make progress. So that's the fact that someone is you know teaching them to play games and all that. That's probably not related to their ability to do the uh, the test. Uh, so these tests are now presented in a completely non-gamified way, but it's still the same type of thing. And they are much better at it, much better even than the social games. So that's one. The second finding is that that's this, this, this impact, in particular, the difference between math and social, which is the true effect of learning the math, it is, it's remarkably stable. Uh, you know, 18 months later, they are still just as much better at it. Uh, so it's not just that, you know, temporarily they got a weekend. And that's striking because most educational interventions have impact that, that vanish over time. So usually you find an effect and then it goes away as, you know, life occurs. Interestingly, we are following these kids now. So this is like now they are in middle school. So we are kind of interested to see whether it's still there. Uh, but, uh, you know, 18 months later, it's still there. Third finding, uh, at end line one, they are still with us. They are still in the, in the Pratham preschool. And Pratham preschool does start introducing numbers and that type of thing. And at this point, the effect is uh, smaller. Uh, so we can also test them on whether they can recognize numbers and shape. And you know, do you know that this is, a, this is a circle, this is a rhombus, et cetera, or the, or the numbers. And they are somewhat better at it uh, uh, all, um, at N line one. Uh, but then that difference entirely goes away as soon as they reach school. So, so they start with, um, you know, they, they arrive at school with a much greater sense of abstract, abstract mathematics. As long as they were in the Pratam environment, there were some translation of that sense of abstract mathematics to, to non-abstract non mathematics. But as soon as they, they leave school, they, they reach school, this is gone. And uh, so that's, that's the result I want to, this means this is a failure as an intervention for my, for my objective. But it's still a, an important result because what it's telling us is that the, the skills have acquired, these kids have acquired some skills that in the proper environment could be translated into learning to do numbers. But the schools are totally unable to use it. And you know it's not entirely surprising because they go to school and they start learning multiplication table and singing songs and so at very early grade mathematics in Indian primary school is more akin to poetry than to math. Um, but uh, uh, this is so I'm not surprised by this result, although I'm a bit sad. But I, um, but uh, uh, I think this kind of shows like we handed you kids <laughs> who were able to do math and you just uh, uh, erased that for them. Without, by the way, raising their, their, their um, uh, non-symbolic sense of math. Sure. Yeah. How, uh, how should we interpret the magnitudes? Is it like standard deviation? It's standard deviation, like in most things. So, uh, so they were, uh, so they were point thirteen standard deviation uh, higher in the in the um, in the symbolic math, which they had not learned in the in the games in the first end line, and then. 0 0.025, which means zero, basically, uh, down the line. So that means that schools are not able to leverage the increased mathematical ability. For, so for us, what does this mean is we have to go back to the drawing board to do that ourselves. I'll go back to that in a bit. But for kind of understanding schools, that's the first point I want to make, is that they were not, the grade one were unable to do that. Now, this maybe they, this is a bit special. They, they don't. They are not set up to. Uh, uh, their, their curriculum is, is is rigid. Their curriculum is is based first on, on you know learning the multiplication table. They can't switch. 
So here's another example of the fact that there is a lot of skill out there that the, 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 the schools are not able to, uh, to pick up. And that studies that uh, we did uh, with the same basically coup, uh, on, um, uh, which is purely an observational study, descriptive study, of kids who sell in markets. So I'm sure you've seen them uh, in the eight countries you grew up with, these kids selling in markets. Uh, and they do a, a ton of uh, math in their, in their head, at least in Indian markets. They just are so fast. And this is something that has always struck uh, Abhijit and me uh, odd about the Acer test, which is how come the kids cannot do the Acer test when they are doing things that are so much harder uh, you know, on a routine basis in their shop. Like what's the, that, so that's kind of the puzzle. And so you might think, well, one reason is that uh, it's only the kids, after all, there are not so many market children and it's only the kids who are super good at math who are selected to, to, to be market children, the other one do, do other kind of things. Or it could be that uh, the SR test is not incentivized, no one cares, they don't do it, so, you know, whatever. Uh, or uh, it could be that they know how to do that in their head, but they can't write, and so they are completely uh, baffled by the physical form of the test. So we kind of were interested in, in, in testing all these things. So what we did is that we ran two studies, one in Kolkata, one in Delhi, uh, where we sent uh, mystery shoppers to, uh, to the shops uh, to buy some fruits and vegetables from the kids. The way they did it is that they they bought at least two things, say eggplant and tomatoes. They bought a, a, a funny quantity, so not half kg. So when you buy, when you go to the market, you can either say, give me half kg of tomatoes, or you can take the toma tomatoes in a basket and you, you get them weighed, so then you get like 323 grams. So it doesn't get rounded up necessarily. So they, they, got, um, they got tomato and eggplant, and then they handed the bill to the person, to the kid who gave them change. So the operation involves a complicated multiplication, uh, the addition, and then the subtraction. And then they kind of challenge the kid on saying, are you sure this is the right amount you gave me? And the kid had to explain, you know, yes, <laughs> you take this multiplied by this, this is this, so you, you know, I'm, I'm right. Uh, so we did that in Calcutta in Delhi, and then we took the kids apart, the, the last pair who went to do their shopping, asked the parents if we could borrow the kids to get, do some math with them. And, uh, and they did, usually they agreed, they came and did some math with some math. And then there we gave them problems of increasing level of abstraction. So it's like an increasing level of far away it is. So see if the guy is selling tomatoes, we're like, so suppose the price of tomatoes is now 23 rupees instead of 20. Uh, uh, how much would I pay you for uh, half a kg of tomatoes? And then we replace the tomatoes by uh, eggplants, and then the eggplant by pence, we are sell by units and not by, and not by kilos, so that changed the operation. So increasing level of uh, dif difference from what you do in a norm in a day to day basis, and, and then abstraction. What is uh, 55 times 7, and basically the SR test. Uh, and then, so that was, and then in Delhi, we did the opposite, which is we went to schools in this very neighborhood. By the way, a lot of the kids who are in markets are also in school, but uh, not all of them. And then, so we went to, to schools where most kids are not working in markets, but they are very similar um, um, neighborhood, social status, etc. And we had them do the same test plus uh, uh, sell items. <laughs> so they set up a little market and they are selling the, selling, selling the items. So that's the project. It was a descriptive, uh, um, very fun study to do. Uh, and here's what we found. So uh, the first thing we found is that our sort of impressionistic impression, that uh, impressionistic impression makes it uh, <laughs> a bit overdetermined, our uh, feeling, observations that uh, the kids are really good at doing this math, uh, seems to really hold true. So uh, um, in Kolkata, they are above, uh, they are around 90% uh, right the first time. And then if they were wrong, the 
since they were challenged, they had a chance to op correct. And then with correction, they are like 95%, 98% uh, in there, in the, this uh, um, um, real transactions. In Delhi, the first one was a little lower. Uh, I think that's because those were relatively unusual for market transaction to ask you two goods in unusual quantity. But then when the second times got around, second person got around, they, they sort of their brain were awake and they were they also with like 94, 95% accuracy. And then you compare the school children doing the same exercise and they are much worse. So, uh, so that's the first thing that they are very good at doing. They are indeed very good at ma market arithmetic, much better than school children. So you could think it's just selection. I, I, so it, it's, it's the kids, the best kids at math are in working in the market. Uh, so we can look at, so, uh, or, or you could say, well, there might be other reasons. For example, they know everything by heart. They just have a table in the back of their mind that, uh, that, that tells them how much things, um, things cost. So here we can look at uh, people's ability to, uh, to, do other, uh, to do other things. Uh, so in Kolkata, we just had one hypothetical transaction that was quite removed to what they were doing usually. And we saw that they were not doing that great on it. Uh, so now in Delhi, what we did is we progressed, uh, as I was saying, by level of how far it is. And so the further it is, the more difficult it is. So if it's the same type of goods, it's better. If it's at least in the same unit, it's better. If it's and so there is some flexibility within, mar within market transaction. They can do other ones. And then the more, but there's a limit to this flexibility. They are, they are. So they are not, it's not by rote because you can change the number on them, but uh, there is some limit to this, to this, you know, how well they can adapt to other things. So they are not like that spectacular at math once you remove. Uh, and where they really have a problem, and again, this is was the sort of confirm our motivative observation, is that they are really terrible at the Pratam, uh, at the Pratam type tests. Uh, only 32% of them uh, can do a, a division in Kolkata, 15% in, uh, in, in Delhi. Only about half can do a subtraction, uh, so similar to the Karnataka level, for example. Uh, and there, the Delhi school children are much better than they are. So it's so it was not like just selection. The best mathematician end up in the class. The, the best mathematician can do market math, uh, not spectacularly because they can't go away spectacularly for their own job, but they they don't have the kind of mental gymnastics to go to other things. Uh, but they really can't go to the to uh, to the other test and they do worse than the daily kids. So the daily kids can do the ASR test quite well, in fact, when you compare to the rest of India, but they cannot do uh, the hypothetical transaction. The market kids can do the ma market transaction, but they can do the cannot do the daily test. And one of the things that really trips the market kids is uh, the where you really have a huge drop off is when things are presented in abstract term as opposed to encored term. So a ki the same kid can do, uh, can you give me uh, the price of uh, one uh, pen if uh, five pen cost uh, 20 cents and cannot do uh, 20 divided by five. So basically this is what this says, this is what this comparison here, similarly for, for those kids. So going to abstraction is what makes it, even if it's the exact same problem, uh, removing the, the, the anchoring to, a, to a real items is very difficult for them. With one exception, when it is possible to round things up, for example, if the problem is 31 times 7, which you can do as 30 times 7 plus 7, uh, they, are, they are good at that. They are good at simplifying problems, even when they are abstract. So uh, when they are, um, so this is a subtraction. We didn't do it for division, but for a non rodable abstract uh, uh, subtraction, even after correction, they, f they finally get it 65% of the time. If it's roundable, they get it 85% of the time in an abstract form. 
if it's encored, they do better to start with. That's what we saw in the previous graph, uh, that the, the, the abstraction tripped them up. Uh, but and then rounded, rounded and uh, roundable and encore, they are you know as good as they are in the market. Uh, they, they reach to 90%. So they are very good at, at rounding. And uh, the, uh, by, by comparison, the daily school children uh, don't get uh, much as much as a boost on rounding as the daily uh, uh, as uh, as the daily uh, market children. And the reason is. The daily school children don't use uh, uh, this strategy at all. So they have, um, uh, this is what they, uh, what they write up. Um, you know, how much, uh, how much do they write on a piece of paper to solve the problem? Uh, and so this is the number of tally marks that they are making. And so the, the kids in market basically do everything in their head. The kids in Delhi do everything uh, written up. They write a million numbers. And uh, I realize that I'm not showing, I, I'm showing you how they write a million numbers. And I realize that I, I didn't take the right graph, so let me. They write just as many numbers if it's roundable or if it's non roundable. They don't, and I don't, they don't use the fact that it is roundable. So the market kids uh, have strategies that they can, uh, they can fall back to when the strategy is applicable. The only thing the Indian, the, the school kids can do is just write down a bunch of numbers and add them up. And some of them might have figured out how to, you know, the algorithm, you know, these guys actually wrote it up, this is, it is written up properly. So these guys know how to, to do addition in a standard algorithmic way, although he hasn't figured out the multiplication yet, which <laughs> finally trips him up. Because <laughs> um, so, the problem is deeper than the school not teaching much, is that they uh, don't recognize that there is existing knowledge, uh, abstract and concrete. These kids uh, in the market, they have knowledge. They know how to do mathematics. The school is, the school, and in, in this instance, impersonated by the, the, the school-like presentation of the ASER problem, is unable to leverage that. And basically what happens is that they see the thing and they say, I'm not good at math. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't know how to do these things. And they, as soon as they see a written problem, or even if you tell them orally the written problem, because oral versus written doesn't make a difference there, if they see an abstract problem, in their mind what it evokes is that, oh, I better take out my, uh, you know, toolbox of algorithm that I learned in school for how to teach this thing. But in fact, they, are, you know, they, they misunderstood the algorithm. So for example, they do the subtraction in this algorithmic way, but from the wrong part of the end, or they do place value errors, etc. That they never do in their real job because they, they don't go back to this kind of half-baked algorithm that they have, uh, that they have learned. Um, so the school is unable to kind of see what's in right in front of it, that these kids have, these kids have the skills and they just, but they don't, their skills are not sufficient because they need to be able to go from this day-to-day, -day, you know, manipulation of arithmetic to more, do you do need to go, you do need to be able to go through the abstraction if you're going to do something more than doing a market kids. You cannot learn algebra without understanding abstraction, but the, the school is, com is completely unable to do this, uh, to do this transition. And then the, on the other side is whatever, whatever schools teaches is completely useless for life because these poor kids who are, school kids who are very good at doing, or relatively good at doing the other math. One thing I didn't tell you is not only they get the market transaction right, but it takes about fif 15 minutes for them to do the calculation because they have unlimited time. So in 15 minutes, they would have been, you know, run out of the market. So they, they couldn't, they, they, whatever they have learned is not useful. Uh, and in fact, uh, um, um, Pratham did an ASER survey for middle school students where they asked them things like, you know, um, you, have a bag of you have a bag of fertilizer that is uh, enough for a, a field of three acres. Uh, you know, your, your, um, your field is one and a half acre. How much of the bag of fertilizer should you use? And the, the, the kids are terrible at doing that. 
And even when they, even the ones who can do division can still not do that, do this type of, so this is kind of a parallel thing of the whatever abstract. So the concrete knowledge is not translated by the schools to abstract knowledge that would uh, enable you to go further. And the abstract knowledge that is imparted is not usable in a concrete way. Yeah. But the outcomes that the market children have are, I wonder if they're actually related to existing knowledge or something that they have learned on the job over the years. That they have learned? On the job over the years. So it's maybe not fair to call it existing knowledge, but something that they have learned. Yeah, yeah but it's existing now, right? Uh, about uh, two thirds of these kids are in school. The market kids are still in school. So whatever, it, maybe they took a long time to acquire it, but now they have it. And they, are still, they still can't do the answer test. They have it there in school. The school could kind of use it. Yeah. So do you think that this is a, more of an issue with like the pedagogy of what the teachers are doing? Or do you think it's more of a measurement issue in that like the ACER and like things should be trying to measure different things or testing in different ways? Like which of these two do you think it is or like which is more important? Both in a way, which is on the one hand, I do think that it's useful to know both for the asset testing, but also for employers, for example, that they could start testing people that they might want to hire with tests that are less dependent on uh, understanding and ability to rehash, uh, rehash uh, um, uh, the, the abstract, the way the, way the mathematics is being taught in schools. So th that's true for ASER, that's true, more even, even more true for, you know, Infosys or, you know, they want a software engineer they want you know, smart people who do a lot of things. Clearly, mediating it by performance in school is, or, even by, is, or even by how you do well at school type exam is a problem. In fact, you see some of uh, the software company like Infosys to run uh, sort of testing camps uh, that are trying to capture another form of knowledge uh, precisely to, to, to get around that. I don't know how successful they are. I haven't seen the test, but that's, so that's a great point. However, the, the second point is, do I see this as a problem of pedagogy? Yes, because it, it, the school is, it is important for people to learn to solve abstract problems. Because otherwise you're, you're limited. Once Infosys hires these people based on their non-school-like tests, I assume they start to tell them you know, some abstract skills, otherwise they would never be able to code. Um, so, so the schools also would need to be able to do that and also to, 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 to help uh, people use the abstract knowledge, uh, to apply the abstract knowledge in concrete situations seems to be part of the... So I would say that this is a problem for both, both things. So that's the problem. Uh, so the problem is deeper than the test scores are low. That's, what, that's kind of what I was trying to, to say. And so where does it come from? So let me start by what, it, what it's not and sort of the general things that you hear. If you, have a Indian, if you ask Indian teachers, they'll always blame the parents or the kids. I think basically some version of the kids don't want to learn or they are lazy or they are not so smart. Or, um, so they can't learn. So that's of course very uh, patronizing. Uh, but it's actually more frequent than you hear. For example, Bill Gates had a whole thing on a, a nutrition program for uh, young kids. And basically, he explained that school performance is low because kids are undernourished, and therefore, they can't learn, which is basically the same, you know, a sort of politically correct argument of the same version. So I don't think it's that. Why I don't think it's that? Because of my preschool mathematician. I'm taking those kids, I'm learning them exactly, I'm teaching them the same thing that the Cambridge kids teach and they are just as good when they were four. So something has happened to them later. Uh, so I don't believe you, you cannot learn the you cannot learn strategy. That's one. Another thing you hear often, uh, especially in the education world, is that it's all about uh, resources. The, 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 the systems are under-resourced. Uh, the, the teacher salary is too low, and also there are no textbooks, uh, flip charts, computers, uh, and so on and so forth in the school. So we know a bunch about that because that's, these are precisely where you have this like uh, huge cluster of experiments that have been conducted over the year. And what do we know? Well, number one, yeah. Sorry, uh, just 
thinking also about the issue you brought up earlier in the lecture about uh, attendance. Is there any argument or evidence in favor of attendance being a factor as well, where maybe there's like very complex returns that you can go every day, you learn a lot, but if you're only spotty with them? There is. Uh, when kids go more to school, is there because they are more present or they are teachers are more present, and they learn more. So there is something, a little bit of something that happens in every day of school. When kids are enrolled in school, they also learn more. So something is happening. So there is some amount of learning that's happening. And you get fewer days of school, you get fewer days of that. And we saw it in, you know, it makes a big difference to, to have COVID. And, and there is no school. So something is happening in the school, not nothing. And then therefore attendance matters. But maybe not as much as should be happening is what kind of what we are. So the argument that teachers are poorly paid, it definitely holds for France, where teachers are very, very poorly paid as a function of their education. I think it holds in the US, though someone would need to check that. It does not hold in India, where the, the, the salary of a teacher uh, uh, you know, in the distribution is super high and conditional on their, uh, on their education even is super high. And after all, we saw in Ghana how everybody is desperate to be a teacher because it's such a is such a, a rent-seeking, uh, rent-paying occupation. Teacher salary in the, um, in the public schools are also much higher than what they are paid in private school, which suggests that there is a huge wedge there. So, the, so it's, it's very unlikely to be due to teacher salary. And in fact, there is an experiment by uh, Kartik Moralidaran and others that demonstrated that in Indonesia, super large scale experiment uh, where the teacher salary was doubled. And the uh, impact on test scores is nothing. Uh, nothing immediately, nothing as you select more teachers and better teachers into the job. Uh, so there is just no effect on teacher pay per se. Yeah. It's not another like, solid problem, but an incentive problem, it seems to me. Yeah, so I'll go to incentives uh, in a moment. Uh, before that, in fact, I'll go to incentive right away. Before that, other resources. So that's where this is like, this line was about like 20 years of research in education, trying everything from uh, textbooks to cutting class size in two to, to uh, uh, um, um, anything you can think of, any inputs except computers. And I'll go back to the computers in a minute. None of that makes any difference. In fact, the famous, you know, Michael Kramer textbook paper that sort of launched us all uh, was an extremely surprising result to him and to, to him and to all of us because it showed no impact of providing textbooks in Kenyan schools that didn't have textbooks. So it's not about stuff. It's not about teacher money. It's not about things in the classes. Uh, then you have like the incent the, the economist uh, sort of knee jerk reaction to so the the. The first one about ki kids can't learn is the teacher's knee-jerk reaction. The second one is the you know, Oxfam teacher uh, knee-jerk reaction. The incentive is the economist knee-jerk reaction. It's got to be incentive. And it's true that directive incentives to specific things has a, s a small effect, some effect. Uh, for example, uh, going back to the attendance question you asked, we have a paper with uh, Rima Han and Stephen Ryan looking at providing uh, incentives to teachers to show up. Uh, and then if you give them incentives to show up more, they show up more. And if they show up more, the kids learn more. So that's, that makes sense. Uh, there is also a number of papers bid, uh, based on providing incentive for test scores. And there the literature is a bit murky. Uh, some papers, uh, for example, Michael Kramer shows that if you give incentive based on test scores, you improve test scores that are targeted but you don't improve, you improve the, the, the performance on the exact test that is being targeted, but not on any other measures of learning. Um, so, and then Kartik uh, has another paper that where he argues that no, 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 there is some gain in actual learning coming from the incentive. So there is a bit of a dispute there. It's a bit in the eyes of the beholder. But I'll grant you that if you give incentive on test scores, there's going to be some increase in test scores. Now, we can just put that aside and say, well, providing in incentives to teachers on, in public schools who are otherwise not very well incentivized is much less incentive than just the private schools. You would think the private schools are the ones that are completely incentivized. 
And in fact, there is a literature in particular with Jishnu by Jishnu Das and Asim Kwadja that is all about the fact that people, parents are super demanding as customers. And if they see that the, the performance of the school is low in the sense that they see low test scores around them, they move the kids. And so the, you would think that the private schools are where you would find uh, um, that, that where the in incentives are very steep. Do you know anything about like the supply of teachers in the sense that like how they are educated to begin with? How how the teachers are, are educated themselves? Uh, so yeah, they go to they go to college. So they are they have they, they have they are well educated. Uh, they don't do much, but they are well educated. They are able to do that job. They are they are I think it's much it becomes much more of an issue in secondary school, if you remember we discussed that is that for secondary school, you start to have a competition between the labor market and the, and the schools. Uh, and so the, best peop the people who would be best at teaching are also very good in the rest of the economy. So in middle income growing country like Ghana or India, you start feeling that for secondary school. But in primary school, you have a vast supply of people who could do a perfectly good job uh, educating kids. And I'll go back. I'll show you why I think they can do their job if they want to in a minute. Uh, uh, so, how should we think, or this is maybe like too big of a question for right now, but how should we think about like all of this literature about like teacher incentives or like school quality and pedagogy or attendance or whatever, um, comparing things that happen in the developing world versus, I know a lot of education literature exists for yeah. the United States or Europe or other such developed countries, and so how should we think about comparing like the findings from those two different literatures? It's a great question. and. Uh, Hold the sword, I'll go back to it. Okay. Uh, I, I think, like in everything where we are wondering how to apply results from one context to another, we have to think whether the context changes the model that of what's being delivered in school. And uh, in this particular instance, I'm pretty sure it does. And then I'll tell you exactly how uh, in a moment. Yeah. What about uh, incentives for students themselves? This is, we're talking about the teacher side. Yes, incentives for students themselves are, are, are effective. Uh, are, they, they increase, uh, they increase uh, test scores. Uh, they increase, so if you give, for example, uh, Michael Kramer a series of papers on girls' scholarship that are conditional on performance, and you get an increase in performance. Okay. And um, that, relates to the, that, that relates to the point I'll, uh, I'll, I'll again, hold it so that's going to become relevant. So let's go, back to, let's go back to my private schools. So the private school you would think is like the most steeper uh, incentive you could get is to just have, to, to run a private school which is entirely funded by parents and p where parents are always willing to walk away. So if incentives are powerful, then private schools should do much better than public schools. Make sense? And in fact, if you compare just at the uh, correlations, Kids in private school do much better than kids in public school. But of course, kid, kids in private school are selected. Their parents have the money, and they also are interested enough to send them to private schools. So we can't do that. Uh, so uh, uh, Kartik uh, Muralidharan ran an experiment on uh, private school uh, attendance. And here I'm going to. I'm going to step back, step aside one point that's going to be my one methodological point for the day, which is he was not just interested in the impact of private schools on kids who attend private school, but he was also interested, which for us for today, for the argument for today is all I need for today, but he was also interested in another question that people, for example, in the US, also in the US literature on charter and voucher is continually asked, which is what's the impact of having more kids in private school on kids that are around them. Either the other kids in private school that they are crowding out in their private school, or the kids in public school that are left in the public school, which might be a good thing because there are fewer kids around to compete with them, or a bad thing because now they've lost their mo most motivated peers. So this paper was really constructed to answer this question of the equilibrium effect of uh, of having more kids in private school, and in particular, the equilibrium effect of a voucher program. And, uh, and it's the first paper that did that, I think, around the world. So what it did is that is, um, he separated the, he, he first, he randomized at two levels, 
uh, you randomize at the level of the village, and then you randomize at the individual level within the village. So, and the village is basically, think of a, a village as a vill basically a school market. Extended village enough to cover the whole school market. So you have, random, you have the control villages, and you have your treatment villages. And then the treatment villages, you further have uh, the kids who were in public school were in principle eligible, they had to apply, there was a lottery, and some of them got it and some of them didn't get it. So now we have randomization at two levels, at the level of the market and at the level of the individual. So if we want to know the impact of going to private school in an environment where there are some private schools and some vouchers around, we can compare these two groups. If we are interested in the impact of this voucher program on the kids left behind uh, who were interested in also doing it, we can compare this group to uh, this entire control group. So you know, this group, the not awarded, basically the control to the super control. If we are interested in the impact on the private school kids who never wanted this in the first place, uh, we can compare them to their counterparts in uh, other in, uh, in the control villages. And finally, for the public school kids who were not interested in the program, we can, uh, we can compare them here. So that's a design, this kind of two-step randomization to look at equilibrium is a design that I've also used to look uh, in, in France to look at the uh, spillover effect of, a labor, uh, of an active labor market policy program. People also look to, to, to look at effects on, you know, allowing some people to migrate on the other people, etc. But that's one of the first papers that did it. Yep. If you were to offer um, the voucher later on to the control group, could you do some matching uh, between the people who later on decided to apply? Or would you be concerned that something in that time span changed? Uh, in so what is the what's the design that you're proposing instead? So I think I would just be concerned about um, the non-applicants or the people who were not awarded the voucher in the control group. Yeah. Uh, if you were later to instead of directly comparing the, the treatment you have right now to that control group, you later give the voucher to the control group and then you just use the individuals who chose to apply. To yeah, so you would be worried that the people who choose to apply, the people who didn't are different in ways that are difficult to, to control. So uh, a paper we didn't have time to cover, but I sometimes cover is the, uh, the deworming paper where they were interested, they tried to estimate externalities without having such a design. So you try to construct a, a group of kids that is comparable of a situation where they are, they are, you know, it's not perfect. You don't have really perfectly comparable kids. So this design avoids that. You don't have to worry about can I make the non-applicant similar, exposed. Uh, you, you, basically, in your design, you would hope that the non-applicant two years later are comparable to the non-applicant you got, uh, you know, that this ones two years later are comparable to them. And then you would look at the externality on them. But uh, it's not clear that they are, you know, it's not clear that you can rely on that. So that's why that th those designs are, are, because it's two years later, who knows? Uh, so that's why those designs are better to measure externality. So that was my kind of advertising uh, pose. <laughs> it's finished. It's a great design. Uh, but it didn't come to be so useful in this particular instance because, uh, uh, in fact, the impact on the people, so here now we are comparing uh, the treated, the people offered the voucher to people who are not offered the voucher. Um, and uh, there is not much of an impact. Um, if anything, so this is in, in, in Andhra Pradesh, the, the, the medium of instruction is Telugu. Public school do not teach English. Uh, and, or, and they do not teach uh, Hindi. Uh, or they might teach a tiny bit of English, but very little. So what do we find? By year two of the program, the kids offer a voucher, actually do works in, uh, in Telugu, although that's not significant, but they don't, know, don't do any better. 
uh, and the standard error is such that we can rule out even modest positive effect of this intervention on them. Similarly, on math, they do uh, much better in English. Uh, and overall, they uh, says big fat zero. You can now, you know, we saw IV last time, so if you, if you want, you can uh, instrument for actually going to school with uh, receiving a voucher. Um, I think this is perfectly decent uh, instrument. So I would not be too worried about the exclusion restriction, but of course it's the same thing, it's just like, uh, just cosmetic. Now, four years later, same thing, a negative insignificant impact on Telugu and on math, positive in English, now he went and collected a bit more data on other things, so uh, um, I think that's environmental and science. There is some positive impact, insignificant impact there. Combined uh, across tests, excluding Hindi, and then he went and collected Hindi, which is not taught in a public school. And when you add the Hindi, you find a positive effect uh, on the private school. Not to say he really wanted to have a positive headline number, but maybe, because this is like, a, this, is, this is an effort. But this is very interesting, because what we have is that the private school are not teaching better at what they, you know, they, they teach. They also teach things, that, but they put more effort in different things. So it's not that they are, and presumably they are doing that because there is parental demand to, um, to do it, and so that kind of that kind of uh, 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 can is informative for us on what are parents demanding, and what parents demanding is not good performance on mathematics and Tulugu. What pa pa parents are demanding is English and Hindi, and um, there is surprisingly there is no. So you, now you can do all your fancy contrast of spillover. It would have been nice if the impact had been positive. Of, of course, there is no spillover of something that doesn't have a direct impact, but it is what it is. Um, so, yeah. Are there experts still effects are too large, right? We cannot rule out even large spillovers. Yeah, the spillover, because the main effects are, are null. And the spillover become, because the main effects are, are zero, the spillover become, where are my spillovers? Become uh, sort of uninteresting and, 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 and uh, uninformative. I don't know if you would call them large. Uh, this is uh, 0.06, so that's, uh, you can rule out 0.12. Uh, point 0.12 standard deviation. If it's like, you can rule out at 95%, there's really nothing to write home about. And negatively, again, you can rule out minus 0.12. You know, if it was a mean, if it was a mean at 0.12, you could say, well, there is something there. It's not a huge effect, but it is an effect. But if it's a 95% in confidence interval that's at 0.12, I wouldn't. Uh, so I don't think the standard error is that huge. Uh, it's just that it's not, there's no direct effect. So it would be surprising if there were spillover effect. Uh, that's, but you know, that's bad luck. It's, I mean, it's bad luck. It's not bad luck. It's interesting anyways, but uh, uh, the, the results would have been more interesting in a setup where you have large direct effects which are undone by spillover. In our paper on labor market policy in France, that's what we have. We have large labor uh, effect when we compare treated and control in the same labor market, but it turns out they are all redistribution within the group. And there is no effect compared to the control group. It's... Uh, the French, ver French saying for that is uh, taking the clothes out of uh, Peter's back to put them on Paul's back. So, but so it's you know, substantively more uh, more fun. But, but but going back to the result, so it's not that the, the, the incentives don't work and that people are not responsive to the incentives. Is that they, they are is that the incentive themselves uh, that that is the parental preferences are not going in the direction of, uh, are not uh, going to, uh, are not uh, targeting uh, the, the fundamental learning. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's consistent very much to what we saw in Kenya, where people don't see much value in primary education whatsoever. They see value in secondary education to the extent that it's a ticket into tertiary education, to the ex which is itself a ticket into, 
into the rent seeking paying job. Yeah. Is this necessarily a bad thing? But it feels like people should be awarded more in the labor market in India than matters, at least for like say Yeah. So that's not irrational. I don't. I think it's totally irrational. Even so, English, for example, makes sense to have a little bit of English. And even if you didn't have English, well, if they cared about is, uh, you know, doing great in uh, is uh, is uh, sort of, and we'll see in a, in a moment is doing at grade level. You know, being doing being able to take exams and not like the learning. What parents seem to care about is what they, what's going to be useful down the line. So a little bit of English they think is useful. You know, we just saw that the math is not, that is taught in school is not of any use anyway. So why would they value it? So I'm not saying it's irrational, but that's the, 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 the parents are, are, are interested not in fundamental learning, but in what's going to be yes, helpful to the kids or to them. So on the one hand, there is English. And on the other hand, there is doing well, as in passing exams. And so there, what the parents are responding to is the structure of the school system and how it's, uh, how it's uh, uh, organized, which is that, and that's not just in India, but that's true in most developing countries, in particular all the, f the former colonies, is a curriculum that is extraordinarily demanding, uh, uh, much more demanding than our primary school uh, curriculum here in the US. That's kind of going back to your question of what's the difference. So this is a snapshot of grade four curriculum in Haryana. So I hope that you guys are kind of uh, good about your table of uh, table of multiplication up to 15. Because otherwise you cannot, uh, if you don't know them like this, you cannot do, uh, you cannot pass your, uh, you, you are not at grade level in grade four in, in Haryana. Um, so you know, by um, in October they are recognizing shape. By November they are measuring the the area. I mean, this is like a bit crazy. Uh, and the that the problem you're finding in 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 a lot of uh, former colonies, and the reason is that the the, the school system was was uh, created not for educating everyone to be able to learn basic, uh, you know, to read and to write and operate in their life, but to educate a minority to become clerks for the colonial powers. And that's what the system was for. When at independence, when it was uh, uh, open to everyone and scaled up, it was open without a change in the curriculum, uh, partly because it's very difficult to say that, uh, oh, no, we are going to go back and, and teach, you know, teach something simpler because that's, you know, that's sort of saying your, your kids are not at the level of you know, every kid. So politically, it's very, very difficult to say that it was difficult to say at independent. It's still difficult to say today that the curriculum needs to be scaled back. Um, so you have this curriculum. In India, they passed the right to education in 2010, saying that every kid has a right to primary education. Great. But part of the right to education law was that the, the teachers have to complete the curriculum no matter what. So they become you know, legally liable if they don't complete this crazy curriculum that n almost none of their kids uh, can uh, follow. So the result is a system where teachers are teaching to one or two people in a class at the very, very top of the class. Which brings me to the US system. The US system in primary school is not that. Is a system of no, no child left behind, whether for good or for bad. The, the teaching standards are extremely low, uh, and you're trying to get everyone to a minimum core. So you might imagine that starting from systems that have different objectives and different philosophy in mind, the, the effect of different intervention would also be quite different. Uh, so that's the kind of the answer to your question. So what's a possible answer to that is, uh, uh, you know, basically teaching is at the wrong level. So you could go back and try and teach at the right level. Uh, and so that's the basically the flagship, uh, the flagship program uh, of the Pratam, uh, the same people who do the ASER, is this teaching at the right level approach, where they uh, um, basically do regular testing of kids, you know, every month or so, put them in groups by uh, level of, uh, by level of, uh, of competencies, attack these competencies, and then move them as they go along. So it turns out that a kid who, who reached grade four without learning to write or read can learn very fast if someone 
understood them then because they are, they are cognitively quite ready. So you, a kid can learn to, to, but if no one is ever teaching them, then they won't learn. So they make, uh, um, so this was my, so uh, something like that, the ancestor of this program was the first uh, randomized evolution I was involved with. Uh, that was called the Balsaki program in Baroda and Bombay. And since then, we've been evaluating some version of this program in rural areas, in urban areas. Uh, at some point, we were ready to scale up. Uh, Pratam scaled up in Bihar. In the context of their scaling up, we were able to carve out a control group. So that's the opposite of your standard. <laughs> And then uh, when you, you, know, you have a status quo and then you do a, a new intervention in a small place. Here, the new intervention was in a large place. So you have all of the problems that will potentially arrive when you do something on large scale. And we took out the control. And uh, it didn't work at all. Uh, and until then, we had great results. And then it didn't work at all. So we had to go back to the drawing board. Um, we tried to understand why it wasn't working. And to cut a long story short, it wasn't working because the tyranny of the curriculum was still there. So the teacher said, I can't implement your program. You trained me to implement this program, but I can't because I don't have the time because I have to finish the curriculum. So the program could not catch with teacher, even though, and this goes back to your questions you asked earlier, would they be capable of teaching? Yes, because if you take the same teacher during summer, we use the same teacher or uh, Bihar, actually, state of Bihar recruited teacher to teach during summer, and we experimented that. And their kids during summer, focusing on basic and TRL approach, did great progress. So in one summer, they made more progress than in an entire school year with the same teacher. Uh, because during the summer, it was very clear what they had to do, and it was not the curriculum. And when you move them back to the normal classroom, they think I have to do my curriculum. Sorry, I don't have time for this teaching and to learn, to read and write thing. So then what we did is that we, uh, um, we, uh, we went back, or Pratam went back and thought, basically it has to be, they, it becomes a political economy pro problem, which is how to uh, get it to take hold in the system. And uh, so we saw that we needed a one, the teachers needed to know that this is the time to do teaching at the right level and you cannot do anything else. So they basically, the, the, the government added a, uh, an hour in the school day, both in treatment and control. But in control, they just added an hour. In treatment, they said this hour is for teaching at the right level activity. K classes have to be mixed. Kids have to learn, you know, to go back to, to do the teaching at the right level activities. And they also enrolled the, 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 the school inspectors to serve as supervisor of the program. And that worked uh, nicely. The other way is to say, well, forget the teachers. Let have it implemented by, outside, by outsiders. That was done in UP. That's a dysfunctional school system. And that, worked, uh, that also worked. So now, uh, Pratam has been scaled up in India. Oh, pardon. The, the, the uh, teaching at right level is being scaled up in Africa, and then it's a model that can, either of these two models is robust enough, can be implemented in other countries, and is being implemented in, uh, in those places. So let me conclude uh, rapidly. I've uh, given everything I told you, you know, how do we go about fixing primary education? So some people say, well, give up on the schools. And in fact, the founder of Pratam, Madhav Chavan, that's kind of his view now. It's like the schools are just a big waste of time. And let's give tablets to the kids in, in villages and then have them you know, learn this way uh, through materials you, you push to the tablets. Uh, it has potential, particularly with, uh, with digital education, but it has a big problem, which is at least the schools, parents have bought in and they're sending the kids there, so the kids are captive. Anything else you have to convince the parents that is worth their while, and it's very hard convincing the parents it's worth their while. So Kartik did an experiment where he found absolutely spectacular effect of, uh, of uh, um, software-based uh, mathematical interven uh, intervention on, on math and Hindi. 67.67 standard deviation. It's like great. But the problem is that even though it was 67 uh, standard deviation, when you ask the questions, the type of questions that are asked on exams, that are the grade level question, there is no impact on those, at least on math. 
That's because the kids are so far behind is that even though they progress, and all of them progress, they still haven't reached the point where the questions that are being asked at the exam are pertinent for them. Eventually, you would think they, they, they reach them. And therefore, the parents are totally not interested. And what happened to this program is that this is a long paragraph, but it's basically to say at the very end of this program that shows these great results is at the moment the experiment was over, the program was finished. Because the parents refused to spend like the few cents to keep it going. Uh, because from their, from their point of view, it wasn't reaching, it wasn't useful because it wasn't bringing the kids where they wanted them to be. So something that's not happening in the school is hard, so I don't think we can give up on the schools. Changing the curriculum would, of course, be the holy grail. It's a politically, uh, I've been trying uh, you know, a, a good part of my professional life uh, with very limited success. Uh, and then there is the final possibility, which is what we started to do in, uh, uh, with Liz, which is to work anywhere <laughs> where it's not yet you know, in the margin. So tutoring programs, preschools, uh, um, the completely defunct schools like they have in New Uttar Pradesh where there is no teaching happening anyway, which you can sort of take over, that kind of thing. So um, I want to let you go, so I won't uh, um, get into the details of what we did with Liz, but basically experiment after experiment, we've developed an approach to teaching preschool mathematics that we think is good and can now be scaled up. So now more and more and more and more kids go to preschool, so if at least they can you know, they can be exposed to our program. Nobody cares. The seem, people seem to be very happy to let us in, operate in preschools. Whereas anything like the teaching at the right level in primary school, you have to fight with this existing, existing pressure. The one worry is, though, is that so these are the details, it doesn't matter. The one worry is that as this margin expands, that's a trade off. You know, this margin expands, more and more schools go to primary, to preschools, that's great, this gives us more space to do our stuff. But then as it expands, people start caring more about it. So there are calls to regulate the coaching centers and what is being done there. And there are calls to regulate the preschool and have a curriculum for preschool. So it's kind of a kind of permanent cat and mouse uh, problem. So the bottom line is that basically you need to be pretty patient, which is I don't think there is going to be a silver bullet, even though we now understand the problem well. We can't, quite, we can't fix it easily. All you can do is having these programs that push a little bit the margin. The gains are not enormous, but they are there, and it's a lot of kids, so that's already something. And there is not going to be a big uh, revolution where we certainly is go are going to make it uh, work so much better. And when I conclude like that, if I give... Uh, uh, similar uh, presentation in, in India, people are really upset. And they come to me, like in particular the tech people, uh, uh, very well intentioned, they say, how can you say that? We don't have the time, we have to. <laughs> I think it's better to do that than to do nothing, which is the, the alternative. We have to act, this generation, blah, blah, blah. So th this is, uh, that's kind of the unpopular message of the own. only thing you can do is push a little bit the the envelope here and there, and you're not going to get a revolution. Yeah. So sort of thinking about the, the um, dialogue between this teaching at the right level program and, and sort of the literature on tracking, yeah. is there a sense within the teaching at the right level of how much of the effect of the program is due to like peer effects of, of like a new configuration of with whom the children are learning versus changes to the curriculum itself? To the activities? Yeah, so I think it's a lot to the, the former which is just a lot of being with a group of your same uh, like-minded kids. And so we have a paper in Kenya with uh, Michael Kramer and Pascaline where we kind of have both because we, we track, and then we have either the regular teacher or a young enthusiastic teacher, and, and we do find effect of tracking in both cases, both for the, both, with, in the non-track school, we have huge effect of the un young enthusiastic teacher and in a track school, we still have an effect of the young enthusiastic teacher, but even in the regular school, the tracking really helps. Even if the education system was structured just to like capture the one politically incapable in, in student and uh, teach math and like, science, scientific skills to them, if the whole thing is the interesting fact is that 
that student also has a higher probability of leaving the country once at, after going through that education system. There is that, yes. Quite interesting. Yes. No, no, I think that you're absolutely right, which is the, 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 the most brilliant, of the, the, the one kid who manages to, you know, make their way to the school system and not being crushed by it and go to university is probably somewhere here. <laughs> so they are they're contributing to the world, but not necessarily to. Okay, great. Thank you. So we'll um, uh, see you next week. Oh, uh, it's a long weekend, so we'll see you on Wednesday.